Dennis Corker here with Bible Blessings Ministries. Thank you for joining me. We're continuing in our verse-by-verse -verse study in the book of Ephesians, and we find ourselves now in chapter 1, down at verse 5 and verse 6. Now, this section that we're in breaks down into three parts, and I've called it in a previous video the Psalm of Paul or a New Testament Psalm. It's really an outburst of praise where Paul gives glory to God. Now, I've covered all of the verses up until this point, and there's some interesting information that you don't want to miss. So if you'd like to review any of the past content that I put out on this chapter to this point, I'll leave a link for you in the description below. And I have been a little bit uh, interrupted in my production of videos, and I was busy with some personal matters that took me away from my usual routine. So I'm hoping to get back in the groove now and continue to put out videos as I have in the past for your benefit and for your blessing. Now our ministry is called Bible Blessings Ministries. And I just want to assure you, one of the things in this life that is very important that you should never consider to be a waste of time is studying the Bible. There are many ways to waste time and we waste time all the time. And we can never get that time back. But time in the Bible is precious. It refreshes our spirit. And for those who aren't saved, it saves our souls when we believe in God's Son, Jesus Christ, and we understand the way of salvation as, as, as it is laid out in the Bible. So I'm hoping if you haven't subscribed already that you'll subscribe to Bible Blessings, hit the notification button, you'll be notified as each new video comes out, and you'll find that studying the Bible verse by verse is one of the most precious and wonderful experiences that anyone could possibly participate in. Now, I just want to give a little bit of a summary to this Psalm of Paul, as I've called it, verses 3 to 14 in Ephesians chapter 1. And 3 to 6 is focusing on the Father, giving him praise in that he chose us, he elected us, we might say, before the foundations of the world. He blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ, and he chose us. And now we read about how he predestinated. We're going to get to that today and the reason why he predestined us. And then when we come to verses 7 uh, down to 12, the focus shifts to the Son, the redemption of the Son, etc. And we'll get to that and cover that in detail. And then in verses 13 and 14, the emphasis shifts to the Holy Spirit. Now, Christianity is unique in this sense. We believe in one God. But what is unique and distinguishes Christianity from other faiths is that we believe God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each person has a distinct function, a defining function. And how do we know that God exists in three persons? Well, for no other reason than that is the way he is revealed in scripture. And if you think about that, I don't think anyone would ever come up with such an idea unless it were in the Bible. But that's what biblical Christians have always believed. We believe in one God manifested in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in the videos I've done already on this section, I believe there's a couple on this Psalm of Paul. You can review them if you like. I'll leave a link for you in the description below. But today I want to cover specifically verses 5 and 6. So let's read those verses together. And uh, verse 5, Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us, accepted in the beloved. Now once again we come to this prickly subject and I covered this in the last video. This controversy, this age-old controversy, Calvinism and Arminianism and people always want to know well what camp are you in and this is almost like a test of orthodoxy and people do get very upset about this and very angry if others don't see it just the way they do. So 
What camp am I in? Well, I fly neither flag. I fly the flag of biblical truth. And that's always the safest way, not just the safest way, but it's the correct way. I think the problem with Calvinism is they try to merge human philosophy, the philosophy of determinism and fatalism with the scripture. And yes, there are some verses that could lead you to think that way. But I think when we look at the Bible comprehensively, we see that that sort of fatalism and determinism is not in harmony with the picture that we get of God or the revelation that we get of God in the scriptures. God is just. God is not capricious or arbitrary in the way he governs the world or in the way he saves mankind. So to think of a God who's sitting in his big throne up in heaven before the world was made and he selected certain people, Fred, Barb, Ken, Ron, Jen, Sally, but he looked over here and saw Fred and Joe and Pete and Randy and Sally or, or whoever it might be. I might have repeated that one, but you get the point. He, he's arbitrary and there's no real reason why he chooses some and not the other. And the Calvinists really like that sort of doctrine. They think it's a badge or a prize to think that way to be able to accept a God that's sovereign. Well, I accept a God that's sovereign too, but not in that way. And I'm not an Armenian either. Why? Because I don't believe you can lose your salvation. Why do I believe that? Well, because in the Bible, when we look at all the verses, we look at them in context, the Bible doesn't teach that you can lose your salvation. If we teach that a person can lose salvation, then we're diminishing the value of Calvary. We're diminishing that finished work that sealed our pardon. And we're in contradiction of many verses that teach that by simple faith in Jesus Christ, once and for all, we are born from above, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, and we receive the gift of eternal life. So I don't Put myself in either camp and I don't think it's necessary. In fact, I'm sure it's not necessary and I want to talk a little bit about this again today because we have the word predestinated or predestined rather. Having predestined us to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. Now this is the purpose of God. This is the reason God created mankind. Yes, God did know that man would fall, but he sent his son to be the savior of the world. In the fullness of times, he sent his son to die on the cross, to make a perfect sacrifice, and to redeem us to God. And we find the word here, another important word, adoption. Now, what does adoption mean? Well, we all really know what it means in our own culture. But Paul was writing here to the Ephesians and really to a Greco-Roman culture. And the word here, really has reference to that culture. And in that culture, when a person was adopted, he was made equal to sons in the family. In no way was he inferior. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ has done. He has reconciled us to God. We were fallen. We were wayward. At one point, we were not the children of God. We were in darkness. We were in rebellion. We were wayward, we were outside of the commonwealth of Israel as it says, when we were not the people of God. But now we are the people of God because we have trusted in Jesus Christ and his blood has reconciled and redeemed us to God. And so this is the plan of God. We have been adopted. When I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I guess it would be 43 years ago, I knew that I was saved. I knew that I was born again, and I knew that I was a child of God. And it's wonderful to think about that, that we've been adopted. And when we think about it a little bit more fully, it also confirms that we can't lose our salvation. How can you be adopted of God and then cast away? 
it's a contradiction, isn't it? It doesn't make sense. Now let's bring into our discussion the word predestined. He predestined us to adoption. Now, the Calvinist would think of this in the way that I described before, that God arbitrarily chose some and not others. So if I'm a saved man, for some reason, God, before the foundations of the world, said, Dennis, I've chosen you. Why is that, Lord? What? Why me, Lord? What have I ever done? Well, there is no reason. I just did it because I'm God, and I have that prerogative. And who's going to challenge me? Well, what about, what about my friend? Why haven't you chosen him? Well, that's up to me. Just leave that to me. See, that's a capricious God, and that doesn't fit. The description of the God of the Bible. So what does it mean to be predestined? Well, I see it this way. And let me just preface my remarks here by saying the reason I see it this way is because I believe that's what the Bible teaches when we look at the comprehensive view of all the verses that speak on this subject. He predestined us. Before the foundations of the world, God set the condition for salvation. That whoever would believe in his son. And it tells us in the scriptures also that the son or the lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. God knew what would happen. God is all knowing. He knew Adam and Eve would sin. He knew that their progeny would be born in sin. And that they would need a savior. So God Predestined, predestined us. Who is the us? Those who believe. And if we look down at the verse 13, towards the end of this little section, it, it says who the us are. In him you also trusted. Those who trusted Christ, those are the ones who are predestined. And they were predestined. Now, it's quite amazing to think about this because we try to get God's perspective and people think, well, so if God predestined some to be saved, doesn't that mean that the man or the person who received salvation really had no choice? They were just going along in life and God zapped them and all of a sudden they were saved and they didn't even know what was happening to them. Well, I don't see it that way, and I don't think we have to see it that way. And it's very difficult to see things from God's perspective. As I said before, we have a finite mind. We have to leave some room for mystery. We can't pry into all the mysteries of the Godhead. We know what he's revealed, but we're limited. But what we do know is that man does have choice. And that choice is real. So somehow, and I don't find it difficult to understand. God predestined or foreknowing or choosing us before the foundations of the world. I don't find that to be in conflict with human choice because I believe that God set that condition. And yes, he knew who would be saved. And in a sense, in that sense, he predestined us. He caused it. But I can't really describe all the intricacies of that process from the perspective of God. But I do know this, he's not arbitrary, he's not unjust, and I can't conceive of a God from my readings of the scriptures who would deliberately create a world with the purpose or objective of casting millions upon millions upon millions into a fiery furnace. So that's my best explanation of that, and I hope it's helpful to you. So he predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. How did that process take place? Well, it was by Jesus Christ, by the cross. And we're going to get into this in more detail in verse 7, so I'll just be brief here. But Christ came into the world a sinless person being truly man and truly God. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He was introduced to Israel as the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. And that sinless, spotless Lamb suffered and died and shed his blood to reconcile me and whosoever will believe in him to God 
and into the family of God. So God has reconciled us by Jesus Christ. And it's important to emphasize only through Jesus Christ. People in other religions think they're children of God. Well, not in the truest sense. They're still in darkness. They're still unreconciled to God until they come to the point of receiving Jesus and him alone as their personal Lord and Savior. And I want to ask you that. Have you done that? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you been born again? Have you been washed in the blood? And have you been adopted into the family of God? And this is God's plan that he predetermined or predestined before the foundations of the world. So you have that opportunity even now to trust him as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, I want to note something else here, too, and I'll read this verse as we come to verse 6. It says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Now, I've described this as a psalm of Paul. And in three places, we read about praise being offered to God. Verse 6, um, and then down in verse 12. And in the final verse, verse 14. So each section, when it shifts from Father to Son and Son to Spirit, the Psalm of Paul here is punctuated by an outburst of praise or by the mention of praise. And here it tells us the purpose of God. God has worked in human history to bring praise and glory to himself. When we're living in this world today, especially with this COVID-19 crisis and all of the doom and gloom that's going on concerning this predicament it's hard to see how God can get any glory out of this but there is a time coming when things will be completely changed there is a time coming when the church of Jesus Christ will be caught up and raptured and taken out of this world we will be changed in the moment in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye and this corruptible man will put on the incorruptible and we have a word for that it's called glorification we will be glorified so really Christians are God's trophies of grace we're like trophies that an athlete puts on his mantle to display his prowess and his victories and that's exactly what we are in Christ we're God's trophies we're meant to be to the praise of the glory of his grace, as it says here. We are really illuminaries of grace. We were unworthy of salvation. We are, were unworthy of fellowship with God. Yet God in grace sent his son. And the Bible tells us here in the book of Ephesians too, by grace ye are saved through faith and not, not of works, not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. So we're the illuminaries or the trophies of grace and that's a, an encouraging way to look at it. God is a gracious God and to remember that will help you when you fall into sin, when you fall into temptation, when you have a guilty conscience. You can always come back and confess your sin and to be restored to fellowship with God, but you must always remember that God is gracious. If we don't remember that and have it really seep deep down into our heart and into our consciousness, it makes it impossible to walk with God. It's only possible to walk with God when we walk by means of grace. So we're to be to the praise of the glory of his grace. And it says at the end of the verse here, by which he made us accepted in the beloved now this reminds me of the baptism of jesus do you remember the scene john the baptist submerged jesus in the waters at the river jordan and when he came up there was a dove who descended in bodily shape the holy spirit in bodily shape as a dove and they heard a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased God's beloved son, his sinless son, the son who is the second person in the Godhead, who has all the attributes of God. He became man and suffered on the cross for us. 
and through his death, we have forgiveness of sins. Our sins are atoned for and covered. And we're brought into the family of God through adoption. And we have a new position and a new standing being justified by grace through faith. And Romans 8, 1 tells us that there now, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, there's now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So I just want to ask you, are you, do you have a guilty conscience? Do you feel that God is distant from you? Do you doubt whether he really loves you, whether he really cares about you? Or do you have the frame of mind that you're outside the reach of his grace? You feel guilty for the sins that you've committed. Well, I just want to encourage you, if you will come and simply trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you will be accepted. And you say, well, I don't feel worthy. I just can't believe that God would accept someone like me. Well, that is the miracle of it. That is the wonder of it. He accepts us despite our sins despite our failures, despite our faults, despite our crimes, and despite our despicable nature. And it is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And the Apostle Paul wrote these words. And let me remind you, Paul was a murderer. Have you ever committed murder? Maybe you have, probably not though. Most people haven't gone to that extreme. Some have, and Paul did. Paul was killing Christians and doing it with great pleasure, reveling in it. And yet, Paul was saved. Not only was he saved, but he was elevated to the highest office in the church. He became an apostle of Jesus Christ and a very successful mi uh, missionary. So if you're thinking that you're beyond the reach of God, you are wrong. God's grace is rich. And the issue is not how bad you have been or how good you are. The issue is, is the grace of God is richer, far richer than you could ever imagine. And it reaches to even the most sinful person. And the only thing God asks of you, and I'll go back to what I said at the beginning, this is the one condition that he determined before the foundation of the world. This is how we are predestined. The condition is that you believe on his son, Jesus Christ, that you rely on him, you trust in him, that his claims are true concerning your sins, that he died for your sins so that they would be washed, blotted out, forgotten, and forgiven. And that sin would no longer be a barrier for you because Christ has paid the debt that you owed to divine justice and it's been satisfied. Just as real as when a person goes into the bank and satisfies a debt, it's clear he no longer owes it. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you know you owe no debt to justice. Your debt is canceled and you're free. You've been adopted into the family of God and you are accepted in the beloved. This is Dennis Corkery with Bible Blessings. Thank you for joining me. Please remember to subscribe to Bible Blessings and do hit the notification button. Thank you for joining me.
That's all, folks.